Part 3. As gunfire rained over through the air, the cracks of rifle rounds flew overhead in addition to explosive ordnance landing near and around their makeshift cover. It had been several hours from their drop, and since then, they have been doing nothing but fighting against an enemy that surrounded them. Ammo was running low, and their platoon was down to a mere fraction of its strength. They had landed in an ambush. Whether accidentally or on purpose, it didn't matter. All that mattered now was survival, or to take out as many of the enemy as possible. Damn it, Timbers! Get me ammo! roared a raider firing from a squad automatic weapon, a belt-fed weapon of lead delivery. He was prone, with the rest of his body resting in the crater from an earlier fired mortar. To act as his support berm, bodies of dead Celians were laid to grant his weapon support and to provide himself cover from enemy fire. Behind him came a raider, light with his load, carrying cans of ammo in both arms with a belt of rounds around his neck. He dove beside the prone raider and immediately began preparing to assist in a reload. What took you so long? If I ran out, we'd be dead. The name of his chest plate was scratched and worn. It was Bridger. We had to dig for it, all right? Shut up and get ready to reload. The one before him was just as old and marked white like his prone comrade. His name was still visible, and he was named Timbers. As Bridger continued to fire, he readied himself for a practice process they had spent the last several hours perfecting, a speed reload of an open-bolt machine gun. Timbers placed half of his body over that of Bridger in preparation. From the outside, it seemed intimate, but in combat, it was necessary. With a click, the weapon ceased firing, and the two began their remedial barrel swap and reload. First, the bolt was sent to the rear and placed on safe. Then the barrel was detached and swapped with a second, locking it into place as the first was glowing orange. The next action they took was Timbers opening the bolt cover, taking care to lower their heads and clearing the bolt of any debris. Timbers fed Bridger a fresh belt of ammo, which he placed into the open bolt. When it was clear with no issues, Bridger slammed the bolt cover down, locking it. He then set the weapon on fire, then released the bolt forward and began firing in three-second bursts. The total time took them six seconds for a barrel swap and reload. Bridger was the main gunner, and Timbers was his assistant gunner. In the case that Bridger was killed, Timbers would take over. It was a grim reality, but compared to other gunner teams, they lasted the longest as a pair. Damn it! Where the hell is the rest of the platoon? Shit, let alone the rest of the company. Bridger complained, firing another burst into an encroaching enemy, slowing their advance. Pop said they're dead, since he can't get comms. We're in the dark, replied Timbers. The squad had long disregarded their helmets, leaving them with only their armor and weapons, and little to no combat information. As they said, information is power, and right now, they lack it. In the initial wave, they were bombarded by mortar fire, clipping their armor, but it was their helmets that took the brunt of the force. However, it wasn't just shrapnel that did their helmets in, but something else, since even those who weren't hit reported zero feedback on their HUD. No night visor, no mini-map, no compass. Must have been the EMP. Who would have thought that they utilized EMPs in mortars, said Bridger. Yeah, no kidding. I thought our shit was rated for EMP, added Timbers. Barely. Maybe for an overhead EMP, but... Not for something right next to us. Damn near fried my brain with how close it hit, replied Bridger. He remembered the moment it hit initially. A small explosion occurred around them as they were organizing a strategy using Pops's tactical map. But as soon as it went off, he and the rest of the squad experienced night. Some of their helmets malfunctioned to the point of a thermal runaway, resulting in most, if not all, tossing their helmets as they burst. They now had no HUD and most of their comms resided within the helmet themselves, so that left them in the dark. He wasn't sure if their internal friend or foe tags were working, so for all the 4th Battalion might know, they were dead. They continued firing into the enemy, forcing them to keep their heads down as the zip and crack of the rounds flew overhead, missing them by mere inches. Timbers, acting as the assistant gunner, paid mind to their surroundings as Bridger fired. From roofs overhead, snipers fired upon them, hitting close to their mark. But Bridger remained unfazed by letting loose a Bert in the direction of a known sniper. 
They didn't move, which surprised him, and it went against everything they knew for the basics. Such in the case of a lone sniper team, it made sense to move after firing, but you could get away with more shots if they were suppressed. The Selians, however, didn't do that. Instead, they acted as run-of-the-mill marksmen, hunkering down and laying suppressive fire for their teams to move in, except they just stayed where they were, making them viable targets. He couldn't say the same for the mortars, however. With no easy marks to make of the enemy, they had to rely on light and sound, two unlucky combinations in the dark of night. Luckily, added tracers allowed for bits and pieces of the battlefield to illuminate, sometimes revealing an unlucky enemy combatant. Say, you still have that flare? asked Bridger. We might need it. Timbers shook his head in the negative. Just one, and I don't expect reinforcements to arrive any time soon. Bridger knew what that meant, as did the other four left in their platoon. They couldn't rely on air support, and they had no way of knowing if there were any raiders in the vicinity who could help. It was a sour realization, but they needed the light to make for a final stand in the hopes that it would deter the enemy and bring in any friends lying near. Let me pass it on to Pops, so he at least knows what's up, replied Timbers. The exchange was short, as it was delivered vocally to the building he holed up in trying to fix their comms, still to no avail. You're good. Get ready to hit him where it matters, replied Pops, loading a fresh magazine into his auto rifle. With confidence, he fired the single shot into the air. The shot itself didn't illuminate anything, as only a dim yellow followed by a smoke trail flew into the sky, screaming like a banshee into the night, until finally it popped. Bright red light showered the battlefield, scattering their shadows that danced erratically and exemplifying their silhouettes. The use of flares did more than simply illuminate an area. Aircraft used them to deviate a heat-seeking missile, and infantry used them to blind night vision, or offer to reveal enemy combatants in a field from overhead simply by the lengthening of their shadows. They have a myriad of tactical uses, but for them, they had little options to choose from. And fortunately, the amber visors of their enemy shone bright and illustrating their V-style construction. This time, Timbers took his rifle alongside Bridger and fired at all available targets that were revealed by the sudden eruption of light that bestowed a moment of resolve for the raiders. A resolve that lasted as long as the flare itself ultimately diminishing after fifteen minutes. Get a beat on him, yelled Bridger as he sent forth sustained fire into Selian soldiers caught by the sudden influx of light. I know, I know, replied Timbers, firing his rifle in a semi-auto fashion, nailing several in the chest before targeting another. He fired enough that he had to reload near four times, and he was on his last mag while Bridger had one more box of ammunition. Damn it! Last mag! We're screwed, and I don't feel like doing a bayonet charge, whined Timbers, as he sent the bolt forward and trained his weapon on the next soul, filling them with hate and discontent. They had little time to make each shot count, and slowly, the brightness of their artificial light source lessened until all that remained were the tracers of cannon fire into the sky from ships engaged in aerial combat. In the next moment, Timbers screamed and landed on his back as he held his shoulder. Ah! Oh, damn it! I'll kill you! roared Timbers, intending for the enemy to hear his pain and promise. Bridger maintained the gun and his fire, knowing that if he let up, they would assault their position and that would spell their end. Don't worry, I got you! Bridger fired, sustaining his fire more than before until he heard a click. He was out of ammunition and his barrel glowed more than before, which illuminated his area slightly, enough for him to see a V-shaped visor staring at him from beyond his berm. He was in the middle of swapping the barrel when the helmet shocked him, that he instinctively used it as a weapon, burning his newfound victim and swatting away its worn weapon it was too late to pull up. It tried to retaliate, but the pain was too much to bear that it flailed its arms towards Bridger, but he continued to hit it until eventually its motion ceased. The smell of burnt cellian flesh assaulted his nose, bringing him back to reality. He was in the open. He tried to rush back behind the cover of his berm, but by then it was too late and a series of sharp pain were felt in his back. It felt numb from the pain, but the initial impacts caused him to stumble over the bodies. Then he landed face first onto his celly and made cover. He looked up to find Timbers applying first aid to himself, and he tried to reach out, 
but he coughed a warm liquid that tasted of iron. Blood. His assailant had hit something vital. His vision was heavy, and his breathing grew rapid, but by the time Timbers looked toward him, it was too late. Bridger, hang on, I got you! He reached for his friend who now struggled to move. He clasped his hand around Bridger's to bring him behind cover, but then it became limp, and a spray of warm liquid landed upon Timber's face. But Bridge, Timbers called out weakly, not knowing if his friend's demise was reality, but deep down, he knew Bridger had perished. Ha! Shit! He screamed, landing a fist into the motionless body of a Cellian corpse. Pops! Bridger's is down! He called out to the building behind him, but nothing came. Only gunfire from a familiar weapon and their tracers were all he could hear and see, his voice going unheard. He relaxed in his hastily made trench, fit enough for only two people to go prone, as he ran through his friend's death in his mind and their increasingly dire situation of faltering defensive lines. But he had a job to do, and that was to man the gun. He peeked over the berm of bodies, seeking if any had come any closer since. They were approaching, and they had noticed him as the sun was now beginning to filter through the buildings, turning the sky from black to a gray-blue. They had begun firing into his position with accuracy, causing him to pause in between actions, but he wouldn't let them stop him. The weapon was already set on safe with the bolt to the rear and an absent barrel of which the one was lodged into a cellian that laid not too far from his position. He stayed low as he tried to fix the new barrel by feel alone, and with a click it was seated. He then threw open the bolt cover, swinging it up as he cleared it of any cartridge links that remained and loaded the first round from their last ammo can. Two hundred rounds. That was all he had left. When he set the weapon on fire and the bolt was sent forward, he racked it again, ensuring a round was in the chamber and began firing. With his vision better with the growing dawn, he was able to pin targets around him and did so with explosive vitriol. He was trying to be careful of his flanks, but as he continued gunning down his opposition, he lost focus of his surroundings, filling each burst with hatred for his enemy. Come on, you bastards! Charge so I can gun you down like a dog! Timbers screamed in between his shots. Come on, bark, you bastards! The enemy mortar presence had lessened, and so did the marksmen who littered the rooftops, but their disappearance wasn't apparent to him at first, as his focus was solely on the enemy before him. Their number was few in comparison to before, but still more than the rounds he had left over. He counted them from the remainder in the belt as the barrel began to cool, as did his earlier heated disposition. Only twenty, huh? He said. It was a miracle they lasted so long even taking ammo from abandoned drop pods they came across before running into the large force that assaulted them. He thought that they could have hid or let them pass by hiding among their fallen brothers and sisters, but they didn't want that. They couldn't lie in wait as the enemy prodded over them. They wanted immediate retribution against them, for they were the enemy. They needed to pay for their attack on the Republic, and he was ready and willing to deliver. But as he was lost in thought, he failed to notice the Cellian that stood over him, aiming their worn and battered rifle against him, with their silhouette against the rising sun and their shadow cast upon him. He was next, like Bridger, to meet his fate. He smiled, thinking it ironic how their platoon was reduced to a mere six men, now down to him for all he knew. He didn't hear gunfire from behind, only silence, thinking they were either killed or captured, and he didn't realize until now. As he tried to raise his hands, the Cellian nudged their barrel toward him as they gave their orders. Don't move, or I'll put you down, Terran. He was skittish in his movements, and his voice sounded young, like a freshly graduated recruit who finally worked his way up to face the enemy his comrades died for, so Timbers could only chuckle at his situation. As he laid there, several more of his brethren showed up, surrounding him as he held his hands away from the weapon with his face against the ground. Good work, Vitra. If you hadn't stayed low for so long, we might not have gotten this far without losing another one of the men, spoke a Cellian comrade. Looks like we also got the others just on the other side, too. So let's wrap it up. We got more on the way to secure this sector. Yes, War Chief, said Vitra. If not for you taking out the other gunner, we might have been in trouble. 
The tone was nonchalant in its exchange like another day of a job well done. It angered him, hearing them speak of Bridger that way. But he also knew that he would say the same thing, in the same way, with complete disregard of how the enemy would feel. It was ironic to say the least, but with it came a sudden change. The one known as Vitra, who stood closely before him, fell to the ground, like a marionette whose strings were cut. The glass of the visor had shattered, and the remainder of the helmet was reduced to the neck as the rest of his head had gone missing. The group of Celians had now been thrown into a panic with the disappearance of their comrade's head and turned to the raider that lay beneath them. What happened? What did you do? Screamed the war chief from earlier, but he didn't know. Hurry! I can see our reinforcements! Grab him and let's be off! Another shot rang, this time from a device that allowed the delivery of thousands of rounds of bullets aboard a mobile platform with an engine's roar to reverberate throughout the open field of bodies and drop pods. Quick and effective, it's perfect for hit-and-run tactics. The Puma. ra ta 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 ta, -ta. It sounded like a swarm of metal wasps and locusts as a hail of bullets flew above him and into the standing soldiers of Celia. It reduced them to nothing but chunks of flesh with bits and pieces of clothing, and armor too stubborn to let itself go from its once sentient host, and he was covered in them. Before he was fully aware, he felt the vibrations of something behind him that crushed wood and bone alike as it rolled through the field. It stopped, and seeing how he was still alive, he turned to meet the one responsible for being his savior. It was a man, donned in the same make and model of issued raider gear as he was, but was marked with worn and pale gold-branded markings. Upon his face was a heavily scarred glass visor, with the only reflective portion being the eyes and mouth, which made him look like a demon. He was a platoon commander at the least, which, in the heat of battle for most raider companies, usually didn't last long. But with the worn scars of battle upon his armor spoke experience and survival, trademarks of a raider. He looked at his nameplate situated just below the neck, O'Brien. How many of you survived? He asked. And who's your superior? After his arrival, several more Pumas scoured the field, letting off their rounds into the approaching enemy patrols. That paired with the main gun of the Grizzlies and the Rhinos, halting their advance. From the Rhinos, two squads of raiders disembarked, engaging with the enemy from afar with accurate fire. It was enough for the enemy force to falter quickly as the combined arms provided superior firepower against the enemy. Timbers pointed to the building where his sergeant had been previously working, still unknown to their status. O'Brien made his way to the building, with Timbers following behind. As they entered the dilapidated building, he already knew his answer. The walls were littered with blood and bullet holes from both parties as he made his way to the central building. He found a familial face slumped over with their back to the wall and the bodies of their enemy before them. In his hand, a spent sidearm cleared of ammo and its slide locked to the rear was seen smoking from its most recent use. Beside him, his combat buddy, a Lance Corporal Rice, was seen bandaging his leg as he was breathing heavily. When their presence was known, he aimed briefly at the two, but lowered his rifle at the sight of friendly forces, relieved. Sir, Timbers, thank God you're safe. Where's Corporal Bridge? He questioned as he continued to apply pressure to his wound. He's... He didn't make it. Sniper got him, answered Timbers. Rice's expression grew sullen at the mention, knowing Timbers to be his A-gunner. Well, Pops took out as many as he could. But there were too many, added Rice. I don't think Bryson and Corporal Tristan made it. They'd be raising hell otherwise. His tone was reminiscent, noting how unhinged they were as a pair. You two are all that remain, replied O'Brien. I'm sorry I couldn't get here faster, but we tried to offer sniper support while we were en route. It's fine, sir, I appreciate it. That sniper saved my life, spoke Timbers. You can thank him later. Are you still able? replied O'Brien. We're still down half a platoon, so we need all available hands if you can. Otherwise, I can request an evac for both of you. Timbers shook his head to the offer. I can still fight. 
Just need a drink and maybe some rest. You can rest on the way to our objective. Get your gear and stand by the puma, replied O'Brien. Me too, sounded Rice, forcing himself up to meet the gaze of his officer. It's just a graze, some morphine and painkillers, then I can fight. Well, it would be a waste to call a medivac for just one person, said O'Brien. I can offer some painkillers. There's a med can with a stim. Use that. His driver supported the raider by offering his shoulder, leading Rice away from the small building which was no more than a pile of rubble. O'Brien took in the scene of the sergeant's last stand as the sounds of gunfire cannons filtered through the air. Without looking, he addressed the lone raider. We have room in my puma, but it doesn't have a gun. But I noticed you operate the saw. My team doesn't operate one, so we can use you. Uh, O'Brien paused, his attention now to the nameplate just below his chin, but found most of it worn and illegible. Timbers, sir. Call sign Juliet 13 Viper Company, replied the raider in question. Well met. Load up because we're hitting their headquarters next, once we deal with their reinforcements, said O'Brien. As they loaded onto the Puma, O'Brien took to the passenger and Rice and Timbers made their seats in the absent rear bed of the vehicle. Rice rested his back against the driver's seat with his rifle slung and fresh magazines for his auto rifle. Timbers sat beside him behind the passenger and rested his machine gun facing forward of the vehicle as their substitute offensive armament. His men were organized in their attacks, systematically using the rhinos as mobile offensive cover as they moved closer to their targets. It was obvious that the enemy wasn't expecting his forces, and the amount of firepower he had brought outclassed that of the light vehicles the Cellians employed. A mix of machine gun and cannon fire continued to litter their opposition until they were seen fleeing down the road they had entered from. They were routed, and the rest of his company regrouped, embarking into the rhinos with a jaunt step. They were soon to enter the heart of the enemy's territory, their capital. Timbers readied himself, filling his emptied belt mags with new rounds which easily weighed down his body, but continuous conditioning allowed him to be accustomed to it. Even though he wasn't able to load on his person the extra ammo, the puma had plenty of unused rounds for his saw, enough to continue holding off an entire battalion's worth in his eyes. He was almost ecstatic, if not for his current situation and the loss of his brothers. He owed it to Raptor for saving him, and now they were taking the fight to their headquarters. Plenty of targets and plenty of rounds to use. Part 4. O'Brien's platoon had driven away a surprise force that entered the park just as they did. Luckily, the use of the Pumas were the first to engage with their chain-mounted guns, making quick work of the ground forces. By weaving through the field debris, they were able to avoid most lethal shots from the light armor that accompanied them. But the concentrated fire from both the rhinos and grizzlies decimated what little plating they had. One round from the Grizzly's main cannon reduced its internal operators into liquid, blowing the vehicle from the inside out using an airburst round. He could only think what the inside would look like, and lucky for him, he had no need to. Jericho Blythe, ready your squads, we're making for the War Council, stated O'Brien. Both raiders obliged, urging their respective squads to re-enter the rhinos for protected transport. He continued turning to Dare over his comms for extended battlefield awareness. Dare, do you have eyes on the objective? As the Puma carefully navigated through the streets of Artre, O'Brien studied his tactical display, and the companies of Raven and Cobra were together as a collective unit as they marched to the eastern area of their objective. When they entered near an enemy group, points of red were briefly illuminated before disappearing after a set of tags labeled Raven H-34 and Zebra A-28, rounded a corner to a building presumably from an alleyway. It was slow, but their progress was steady. He just needed them to make more noise. I have eyes on it looks heavily fortified. Wait one, reported Dare. As he observed the objective, he noted its defenses and relayed them to O'Brien. From his angle and distance, he was able to make out a fair portion of their defenses from his scopes alone, which aided in his reconnaissance. The building itself was large, and sat within a raised outer wall that he noticed to be sandbagged on the other side. A wealth of Cellian soldiers patrolled within the compound, conducting maintenance checks on what looked to be automated defenses on the ground level. 
He also noticed a slight shimmer that surrounded the compound itself as rain fell, as well as a stray bullet or two from the east. He also noted that when it fired a counter-missile, the glow of the shimmering surface subsided momentarily to allow for the exit of their countermeasure against aerial strafing. He knew that they couldn't bombard the zone, since they needed the occupants from within alive. I've identified a shield generator, but I'll need a distraction, requesting permission to authorize use of an LGM, said Dare. Wait one, replied O'Brien as he forwarded the request to the fleet tactical operations officer. The request was acknowledged, but they would have a small window to execute their plan. You're a go, but we'll have little time since the flyboys are preoccupied trying to maintain air superiority. Understood, replied Dare. He then swapped the use from his suppressed marksman rifle to the larger, harder hitting option. The weapon was set on rubble he took from his surrounding area as aim support. He eyed the device that generated the shield surrounding the compound, and on his side, a missile battery was situated. His thinking was that if he directed a missile strike against that point, it would launch a counter, lowering the shield appropriately for him to take the shot. Ready, sir, Dare affirmed. All right, patching you into a designated pilot. Stand by, said O'Brien. After several moments of Dare maintaining a sight line on his target, his comms were then connected to the pilot who would offer their services. This is HFP Scribbles. How copy, said the pilot. This is Sergeant Dare. I have a target that needs a splash, replied Dare. Are you capable? Understood. I have a set of Mark 134S that need a home. I might need a laze, so designate your target. I can drop in 40, reported Scribbles. Dare clicked a button atop his scope of his anti-material rifle, which was a powerful infrared laser, which had a decent range, almost matching his rifle's maximum range. But for the current distance, it was more than enough. He began circling his rifle in small circles, allowing for the pilot to be given a general location of where to drop, and from there, the missiles would trail towards the end of the laser. You're linked. The missiles are yours in three, two, send it. You have the bag, reported Scribbles. The missiles were sent, and from the corner of his eyes, a small trail of bright light exited the exhaust as they flew towards the end of the laser. He didn't leave his eyes off the target, and saw the missile battery orient itself in the direction of incoming ordnance. He waited until the first counter was fired, lowering the shield for a moment, but he didn't fire. He watched as the edges of the shield began to glow, closing halfway before launching the second counter to his second guided missile. It opened larger than before and then he fired. It took just over a second for the bullet to travel to its mark as he fired through the smoke caused by the missile battery. There was a small spark and a shudder of the shield overhead. It had overloaded and their shield was neutralized. However, he couldn't risk its repair and fired a second shot into it, causing it to smoke profusely from its unintended entry. From overhead, the missile battery had downed the first missile, sending shrapnel down from overhead, coincidentally colliding with the second counter-missile, leaving the last missile free to land onto the roof of the building. A quick flash of orange was seen, followed by a burst of smoke. As the dust settled, the fate of the local missile defenses were revealed, showing them to be nothing but torn to shreds from the concussive force and shrapnel the missile delivered. They were now clear to assault the council chambers and they were going to go all out. You're clear, sir. We have a splash. And shields are down, reported Dare as he loaded a third round into the chamber of his rifle. I've got you covered. Good work. Stand by and cover our approach, O'Brien said as the rest of his platoon made their cautious advance through the now war-torn central city of the Selian capital. However, unknown to him, his squads were a building over from their objective, as indicated by a waypoint on his HUD. Since when were we so close to the objective? said Grayson. I bet if we didn't assist Viper, we'd be on their doorstep by now. O'Brien opened his tack map, and lo and behold, their objective lay just on the other side of the building they previously inhabited with the Selian ambush. There were routes of alleyways that led to the other side. He decided to advance through them, and have the vehicle split evenly and take a wide berth in a flanking maneuver, diverting attention to the sides, and not from the enemy's immediate sides. 
he had the option now to return to it, or to attack from their current position from the northeast of the compound they were supposed to target, and looking back, he knew they were close to the objective. But he couldn't allow himself to let all of a raider company die. He saved two, but he wished he could have saved more. Can't let them take a total loss like that. I just wish we aided them sooner. Now we're down an entire platoon. Raven and Cobra are advancing, but they don't have armor for cover. They're entirely on foot, spoke O'Brien. He contemplated their support and opted for the most logical. Puma and Rhino teams assist Cobra and Raven companies in their assault. If it moves, turn it to paste. He received a hearty A, sir, from the teams as they raced to their brothers and sisters in arms, with a single grizzly following behind as added comfort for the troops. O'Brien and the rest of his platoon then took up their advance alongside their only grizzly. As they advanced, the sun rose, indicating that it was now mid-morning, and their visibility was at an all-time high. Even now, the roar of ship engines rang overhead in a screech that ravaged their ears as they chased weary enemy pilots. With the blue sky above them, black specks were much more visible as they danced around in the sky and the frames of larger ships loomed overhead as they exchanged fire against one another. It was aerial chaos, and their victory awaited their success. Before they knew it, they had arrived where they last rested, with the fifth floor of the building still riddled with holes and broken glass. O'Brien then ordered their dispersal, breaking down into fire teams. Timbers moved through the buildings with rice carrying all the ammo as they set up their machine gun nest. Timbers' nest rested nicely above in a mid-level floor that overlooked the compound by roughly 100 meters. He chose the building with the thickest walls compared to the surrounding buildings. Some of the walls were blown out, he guessed from the explosions prior. Luckily, it gave him a decent enough view of the battlefield, and he readied himself for the call to engage. Jericho and Blythe took their respective squads wide towards the roots of the alleyways and stood by in cover before O'Brien gave his orders. They were the most numerous, and at most strength. All of Bravo's squad was absent and most of Alpha, leaving enough for a fire team at best. Grayson stood by as Fox and Ryder scouted close to the exit of their alleyway. O'Brien stood by as he observed his tactical map. He noted the path of the Pumas, Rhinos, and Single Grizzly racing down a road opposite of where the raiders were engaging, effectively catching a wealth of Selian troopers and light vehicles off guard. They were either run down or gunned down by the vehicles. Their push was enough to disrupt the enemy, as he noticed a wealth of raiders rapidly advancing, with enemy indicators popping quickly into existence, but being equally extinguished as fast as they showed up. They were efficient, killers, and even he can tell how well they worked in small teams. Deadly, fast, and efficient. A trademark of earlier raiders when covert ops were the regular. They're certainly working the enemy into the ground, stated Grayson as he peered over his shoulder. Couldn't be me, he said with a nonchalant and condescending shrug, clearly mocking the poor enemy's performance. When your rear gets hit by several tons of steel and lead, you can bet you won't have a good time. Distract and destroy, replied O'Brien and he readied himself. He checked his pouches for ammo and his gear in general, as did the others. When he was set, he gave the call. Raptor Company, Delta Platoon. Assault is a go on my signal. Stand by, he radioed. He had a plan to make it as flashy an entrance as possible, especially with the rapidly approaching Raven and Cobra companies. He wanted his forces to be supplemented with the rest of Raptor, but they were still busy, and the rest of his platoon was being medically treated. It was now or nothing. Badger's Hunter, what's your ETA? He questioned. A bout of static came through his radio before eventually clearing itself, and a familiar sound came through his radio. It was Badger's. Entering the airspace now! But we practically entered contested space! Breaking through now! We'll have you in thirty! He reported with his voice fading momentarily as he focused an order to a fellow raider that shared the same space. Load the 150 and get the 30 prepped. How are we on the 75? Damn it, Hunter! I said the 75, not the 20! Badgers turned his attention back to O'Brien, not paying mind to having his officer wait. 
since his job was just as crucial to the operation as the boots on the ground. Sir, we have you. Stand by and get ready to move. Controls are mine. He paused, and the sound of concern came over him as he reported to his officer. Sir, you have a large enemy force approaching from the south. O'Brien was pleased with the assistance, and it was going to be a spectacle to behold. They still had some time, so his best bet was to take control over the compound and wait for them to come. But Badgers had a different idea entirely. Silently, tracers from the sky began raining down, with the whistle of their rounds filling the air beside the impacts they made that generated loud thumps and booms depending on the round, and all of it was concentrated on the compound's courtyard. O'Brien watched as the originator of the ordnance circle above them and bursts of tracers traversed the sky, enlarging as they grew closer before ultimately impacting the unfortunate souls before them. Chaos, dust and explosions littered the ground, destroying emplacements and reinforcements of the compound. It was death from above, and even when attacks on the compound subsided, the rain of fire was simply redirected to the next group with O'Brien listening in over the all comms. Raven. Cobra, this is Raptor Delta-1, 5, danger close. Badgers fired into the large groups that gathered to his present, but delivered a well-placed shot of the 150mm cannon. Delivering high explosive airburst 150 Mike Mike. Splash, 12 plus KIA. Switching to the 30, reported Badgers. As he said, a slow firing burst of high explosive 30mm cannon rained down on scattering Selian soldiers reducing them to chunks of flesh and ash. This attack continued for several passes, reducing the once staggering enemy forces to a mere fraction of its former self. This allowed for the majority of the other raider companies to advance faster than before, with O'Brien and his platoon arriving cautiously to the compound gates. How are we on that enemy force from the south? inquired O'Brien. We got some ammo left, so we'll give it to him as a present. Won't be enough to finish them, so you'd best hold out, said Badgers. Copy, RTB to rearm and refuel, replied O'Brien. And with that, Badgers left the comms chat, leaving O'Brien with the naval command and his fellow raiders when a voice rose in his head. It was Athena. For what purpose does a ship need for a tactic such as this? It seems redundant, said Athena, a voice who had remained quiet until now. Well, if we used a ship's cannons for ground support then we'd most likely be caught in the vicinity. It's just not viable as air support, and it does wonders on infantry. Personally, it's a favorite, replied O'Brien, as he gave a hand gesture for his fire team to advance. Fox was the first in the group and entered an opening in the wall. He did so cautiously, still unsure if the bombardment got all the enemy forces in the area. Even with an attack like that, there would still be survivors so they had to be cautious. With most of the platoon entering the compound grounds, they found it to be riddled with nothing but dirt craters and pieces of the enemy. It was a gruesome reality that this compound was bristling with personnel, and in the manner of just several minutes, were reduced to nothing, with the only evidence of people having been present were the blood-stained walls and barely recognizable limbs. But after securing the courtyard portion of the compound, O'Brien was soon met with the platoon commanders of Raven and Cobra companies. The first to speak was marked with a sigil of a raven on his chest plate, and the letters Jakal imprinted on his nameplate. Second Lieutenant, Jakal, Raven Actual. He presented himself, still new but experienced enough to conduct himself well. I have my men prepping to hunker down, a suspected enemy counteroffensive. O'Brien nodded. It seems so. The gunship just spent the last of its ordnance on them, but they report they still have a sizable force. Hunker down along with Cobra in the surrounding buildings and get ready to meet the enemy. The lieutenant left with the rest of his men, each wearing a variation of their insignia. The second one to meet him was an older man who looked to have a gentle exterior, but hid an excessive interior beneath all the armor that he wore. He was an old friend to O'Brien, and he was the first support after his first real mission, and consequently his first blood trial. Major Raiku. Fable, my boy. Good work with the assault and wonderful display we needed the cover. Gave plenty of the shinies some great experience for their first ever trial. So, 
This is the objective, yes? The council chambers? Spoke the major in a familial tone. O'Brien could only smile upon seeing his face and his nonchalant attitude. It's been so long since I pinned you as an officer. To think you'd be the one leading the charge. He gave a hearty laugh that was infectious to those around him. Yes, sir, O'Brien said with a small smile. I'm taking the rest of Raptor in to secure the assets. Then we'll be done with this war. Oh, I'm certain there will be plenty more where this came from. Perhaps not like this, but it shall come. You know as much as I do, life is layered aplenty, and so are our problems. We just need to be the ones to make sure those at home don't have to worry, now that we know we're not alone, added Raikou. O'Brien appreciated his words that delivered him comfort in his duties, while equally instilling confidence to do whatever needs to be done. It was refreshing to meet with him in the midst of chaos, but it also brought him back to reality that they were nearing the crucial part of their mission. Oh, and you might want this. Raikou delivered an item previously concealed by his frame. It had a tubular lower half with a rounded grip at the bottom with a ventilated square barrel shroud. It was part of their usual catalog of armaments, but it wasn't an active service in the field since most engagement ranged from 100 to 300 meters on average. But it was a welcome addition. Eight gauge. I don't know what you'll find, but this gal will make short work of anything that wants to meet God himself. Go now. I'll take command from here, said Raikou. O'Brien did as his mentor said as he slung the weapon in a position that wouldn't get in the way of his current equipment. Overall, it rested comfortably on his back when he tightened it. It wasn't a weapon he often used and nearly forgot how it handled, but looked forward to it. After delivering his orders to the rest of his platoon, they gathered in the entrance of the building's reception area with their weapons drawn. It was empty, and the light from outside filtered through, illuminating a vast majority of the space. He found it a miracle that the direct hit of a bomb didn't level the place, but the space proved to be larger than expected. They had to split up. Spread into fire teams and search this place top to bottom. Jericho, Blythe, secure this wing. Test for any secret passages and hidden assets. If you find anyone and they present a clear threat, waste them. I'll take the northern wing, ordered O'Brien. With him, Fox, Ryder, Grayson, Timbers, and Rice entered through a set of dual doors. It was barely open, but Gray had seen to its compliance. The room they entered was moderately sized, with a path leading toward a set of raised pedestals and desks, with the floor before it designated for an audience of a requesting individual. Dim lights littered the pathways of the room, allowing for them to see since a series of blast doors covered the overhead glass. As they searched the immediate area, Fox led Ryder to a door to their right and opened it, with O'Brien following. The space was enclosed, but large enough to fit a moderately sized ship within it. Fox directed the attention of the two toward a button on the wall and pressed it. With a hum, the gears of mechanics began moving and opened the roof of the room revealing it to be a landing pad. Seeing nothing of value, the three began to depart the brightly lit space, leaving it open for friendly transport if needed, but were interrupted by a call of a hollowed voice that rang in their heads. It was Athena. Sir, if I may, there is a console present so it's possible to derive information for a later debrief, she said. Granted, he said without worry. You can fill me in after we secure the assets, clear? Understood. She replied. With nothing left of the audience chamber, the team gathered at the next point, where he met Grayson, Rice, and Timbers waiting for them. Anything new? asked O'Brien. Just their rooms. Five in total, replied Grayson. Nothing we couldn't read right away, but we've tagged them for the other squads to pick up. O'Brien nodded to his report and looked to the raiders beside him. They weren't his usual crew besides Gray but they had shown themselves to be capable enough to earn their stripes since they were only banded white, although worn and peeling. He knew he could rely on them, and so they advanced. The entrance led down a long series of steps with dim lights revealing each step before it stopped at another door, this time locked. It was a moment that he wished Strega were still present, but he remembered his electronic friend who hung on his waist. Athena, can you crack it? he asked to which she replied as if she was insulted. A trivial matter, I assure you, sir, she returned, 
as he placed her device to the side panel that married the door. With a whir, the doors were open, and the letters above him were translated with a quickly generated overlay. Inner Sanctum, 